Welcome everyone. In this lecture, we will talk to you about um, blood supply of the nervous system. And uh, indeed, in this lecture, I will uh, try to focus uh, on the brain and the brain stem because the blood supply of uh, spinal cord already discussed somewhere else in the previous um, uh, system. So at the end of the lecture, I'm expecting to um, get these objective and I would start with this figure which is very nice figure if you remove everything from the brain except the blood vessels you will get this view in which you can notice here that the um, mesh work of vessels um, is more dense in the gray matter this is the gray matter almost here and this is the say the white matter look at the uh, vessels here in the um, a gray matter which is uh, tightly packed and they are very close to each other why because it corresponds to the greater metabolic needs of uh, a neuronal uh, cell body exist uh, in the gray matter and you know that the axons of these cell bodies of neurons create the white matter but you know the metabolic need of the cell body of cell bodies uh, way more than the that needed by the axon anyway uh, let us start with the blood supply of the brain and I would summarize it by say listen there are two arteries um, uh, supply the brain and the brain stem you have two internal carotid arteries here this is the right one and of course there's a left one and you have the vertebral arteries that means you have internal carotid artery and vertebral artery uh, one on the right and one on the left these are the two main arteries supply the brain now again this is you remember i think the uh, common carotid artery that divided into external carotid artery that you know uh, supply the um, face and the neck while the internal carotid artery that gives no branch in the neck but it ascends up to supply let us roughly now say that internal carotid artery supply the anterior two-third of the cerebral uh, uh, hemisphere while the vertebral artery supplies the posterior one-third of the cerebral uh, hemisphere while now the diencephalon of course supplied by both the internal carotid and the vertebral artery now let us start with the vertebral artery this is again the vertebral artery which is you remember the subclavian artery this is the subclavian artery that divides into three parts so in the first part you will see that the vertebral artery arises from there and it ascends in all cervical uh, vertebrae except C7. So the transverse, uh, the transverse foramen of the C7, I mean cervical vertebra number seven, or the vertebral artery bypass, bypass the transverse foramen, uh, foramen of C7. Then it ascends in all the transverse um, uh, uh, transverse foramina of all cervical um, vertebrae all the way up and then it passes through this foramen the foramen magnum the largest uh, foramen in your head in the skull anyway this is the vertebral artery passed through the foramen magnum then at the lower border here at the lower border of the pons at the lower border of the pons it joins its fellow it joins the vertebral artery on the left side so both they create something called basilar artery this is the basilar artery now what we are still talking about the vertebral artery or arteries and it's good to have an idea about the branch uh, coming out from the uh, from these arteries first of all this is the uh, vertebral artery here on this side and this is one on the right side so again let me remind you with the brain stem this is the uh, middle brain and this is the pons and this is the medulla oblongata so uh, again this is the pons right so 
At the lower border of the pawns, the two vertebral arteries, they meet each other here to form the basilar artery. This is number one. Back again to the branch. Look, from the right and left vertebral artery, medially, they give, they give sorry, two brands. They unite to each other to form anterior spinal artery. It supplies the medulla blangata and descends to the spinal cord. You see here, to supply the anterior aspect of the spinal cord, a medulla blangata, called anterior spinal artery. When you say anterior spinal artery, what comes to your mind is, okay, anterior, that means there is posterior spinal artery. This is the posterior spinal artery in which mainly 70% uh, uh, it comes out uh, from the posterior inferior cerebellar artery posterior inferior cerebellar artery yes there is a branch of vertebral artery here called posterior inferior cerebellar artery is for cerebellum in which surface of cerebellum the inferior surface of cerebellum say for example here is the cerebellum you are looking to the inferior view of the brain and cerebellum so Again, this is the vertebral artery here, and this is the vertebral artery here. So there is a branch coming out from it called posterior inferior. Look at it, follow it. Yes, so it goes to the it goes to the cerebellum here, inferior surface of cerebellum. But you know, here is anterior and here is the posterior. So it supplies the anterior inferior or anterior posterior. No, anterior. Uh, it supplies the inferior posterior inferior posterior surface of cerebellum okay leave the anterior inferior leave this region now okay what we have also other than anterior spinal posterior spinal and posterior inferior cerebellar artery yeah we have a couple of meningeal uh, arteries to the dura mater and posterior canifus and you have also medullary um, the brand to supply the kind of the uh, medulla blangata so these are the main brands of vertebral artery so yes they are united at the lower border of the pawns here this is the lower border of the pawns and here guys you see that the the vertebral arteries uh, united to form the basilar artery at the lower border of the uh, which is uh, which is important at the lower border of the pons. Now they form the basilar artery. This is the basilar artery. If you remove the basilar artery, you see that the pons has like a, a sulcus here under the artery. This sulcus called the same name, basilar sulcus. So it's located here. So under the basilar artery, there is a basilar uh, uh, sulcus at the anterior um, uh, at the anterior surface of the um, pawns here. So the basilar artery continues all the way up on the front of the pawns until it reaches the upper border of the pawns where it divides to give two terminal branches you see here called posterior cerebral artery. Posterior cerebral artery. Now cerebral not cerebellar which is uh, uh, that means you have to um, keep it in your mind, but when you read it, posterior cerebral artery. Cerebral area, I think, needs or deserves anterior, middle, and this one, the posterior. But for now, the, the terminal branch of the basilar artery uh, are two branches called posterior cerebral artery. Okay, now remember the basilar artery this is the basilar artery with two terminal branches, is like the palm tree, right? This is the terminal end. We'll talk more about it. So, yes, let us uh, have a look on the branch of the basilar artery. First of all, this is the basilar artery. Once it starts or formed, it gives two large branches. You see here, this one was already cut, and this one, let us follow it. Oh, yes, it goes to the cerebellum, to the inferior surface of cerebellum. And we said this is anterior and this is posterior. And you are looking to the inferior surface of the brain and cerebellum. So, this branch uh, supplies the inferior surface of cerebellum. Excellent. So, but 
which part of inferior surface the anterior the anterior or posterior no it supplies the anterior inferior that means this branch is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery because it supplies the cerebellum which part of cerebellum the inferior surface which part of inferior surface the anterior part of inferior surface of cerebellum yes also after it you will get another small branch here which is labyrinthine uh, artery from its name it's for it passes or uh, it enters the uh, internal acoustic meatus the internal ear to supply the inner ear Again, this is continue with the basilar artery. So in the uh, front of the pons, it gives like pontine branch from its name, pontine branch to supply the pons. Now, at the end, the basilar artery gives like um, the, the we we have two terminal we have two branch still, which as I mentioned, like the palm tree. This is the last one, and this is one, and this is the last. One, so you know this terminal branch already, right? Which is this one, posterior cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery. So from its name, we'll talk more about that. But it supplies the um, uh, occipital lobe mainly, and this area we'll talk about it. And but before that, the one before the last, which is the this one so what's the story of this artery this one is the superior cerebellar artery superior cerebellar artery so yes here is the um, uh, uh, cerebellum again we finished the inferior surface but what about the superior surface here of the cerebellum so this branch this branch is the superior cerebellar for the cerebellum but which surface of the cerebellum the superior one so pons give uh, pons uh, the uh, sorry basilar artery gives two branches to the cerebellum okay now this is the end story of the by you know these two terminal branch the uh, two posterior cerebellar artery which is keep it in your mind we'll talk more in details about it this is the story of the basilar artery and its branch there is another view if you want to look uh, to the basilar uh, this is the vert left vertebral artery that joins the right vertebral artery at the lower border of the pons here to form the basilar artery the basilar artery gives the um uh, this one which is the uh, uh, um, anterior inferior cerebellar artery but remember that the posterior inferior cerebellar comes from the vertebral artery itself forget now let us talk about the uh, basilar artery with the first branch here you see the anterior inferior cerebellar and labyrinthine artery to the inner ear pontine, uh, pontine arteries to the pons then at the upper border of the bone it terminates uh, before its termination it gives the another branch to the cerebellum to supply the superior surface of the cerebellum which is called superior cerebellar artery here's another view you can also with labeled um, stuff there yes that was about the vertebral um, artery now what about internal carotid artery which is the um, other source um, that uh, another source that supplies the uh, as we mentioned the anterior two-third of the cerebral hemisphere plus part of diencephalon which is the internal carotid artery look at the internal carotid artery here in which it's a branch of common carotid uh, artery and it reaches the cranial cavity by passing through the carotid canal here then once it passes the carotid canal it passes through the cavernous sinus look at the cavernous sinus here on the uh, on the right and uh, on the left so it passes through that means it pierces the cavernous sinus 
right? We, uh, of course, with a couple of nerves, we'll talk about them. And once it, it passes through the cavernous sinus, it um, then passes through the uh, subarachnoid space, which is the um, correct uh, location. And it, it gives, of course, the internal carotid artery, once it gets in the brain, um, it gives like many brands. Most importantly, of course, we'll talk about all of these brands, but most importantly, the anterior cerebral and middle uh, cerebral artery. And of course, a couple of other brands, we'll talk about them. Here's another figure we will use it. Um, yes. Now, the um, branch of this very important artery, the branch of internal carotid artery. Well, look at the internal carotid artery. Why it's like this? Because you have to flip upside down the figure, right? Because, for example, this is the optic uh, chiasm and uh, stuff like that. And so the artery or the arteries ascends like this and pass through the cavernous sinus. So he, this is the artery again. So we cut it from here, cut it from here, then we flip it and we are looking to it like this, right? So again, this is the internal carotid artery. So it gives many branch. First of all, you remember from the last um, uh, system previous system, the pituitary gland, so, or hypophysial uh, gland, so the internal carotid artery, it gives superior and uh, uh, inferior hypophysial uh, uh, branch. This is the first uh, artery. Also, it gives um, choroidal artery, which is not shown here, and most importantly, the internal carotid artery, it gives two branches posteriorly, posterior communicating artery. These are posterior communicating arteries to, to connect the terminal. Do you remember the basilar artery with its two terminal branches? The two terminal branches were called posterior cerebral artery. That means by this connection, posterior communicating artery, we connect the vertebral artery with its terminal branch and so forth to the internal carotid artery. That means the two sources of blood supply to the brain, including the internal carotid and vertebral, are connected here. And they will form a circle. We'll talk about it. So these are uh, uh, posterior communicating artery. Why posterior? Because you have anterior communicating here, arteries. Anyway, so other than the hypophysial arteries and the choroidal and posterior communicating artery, you have two ophthalmic arteries not shown here. Better to show you here in this figure. Again, this is the anterior carotid artery. Anteriorly, it gives uh, a branch here, and of course, on the other side here, the called ophthalmic artery to the eye, right? Ophthalmic artery, this is the ophthalmic artery passed through the optic canal. Okay, now what else? What you can see? Um, uh, what other branch shown? Okay, you have here, guys, the um, anterior, most importantly, these arteries anterior cerebral and middle cerebral. These very important arteries, right? very important branch of internal carotid artery. Let me erase these things. So, again, this is the internal carotid arteries and this is the anterior cerebral and middle cerebral. That means anterior cerebral, middle cerebral. Where is the posterior? This is the posterior cerebral, which is the terminal branch of basilar artery. Excellent. So now you have an idea where is the uh, stuff of the cerebral uh, cortex, anterior, middle, and uh, posterior artery. This is another uh, one. So the anterior cerebral artery, um, 
Well, in, indeed, it's very important artery. The anterior, middle, and posterior are very important arteries, including their branches uh, and their supply in the brain and their occlusion. What's going on when they are occluded? What's the area affected? These are really very important for you as a clinician and in the exam as well. So the anterior cerebral artery, let's start with the first one. This is again, they, let me remind you that this is the internal carotid artery and one of the most two important brands of internal carotid artery is the, or the, are the uh, anterior cerebral artery. This is the anterior uh, cerebral artery. Look at them here, guys. The, this is the optic chiasm and these are optic nerves, right? So they are passing lateral to the optic chiasm and superior to the um, optic nerve. They passes anteriorly from their name, anterior cerebral. So passes anteriorly in the longitudinal and the fissure, do you remember the longitudinal fissure that um, divides the brain in two um, equal hemispheres, right and left, anyway. So they continue anteriorly, as you see here, and most importantly, look at this area. They are connected to each other, um, I mean the right and left anterior cerebral artery by anterior communicating small artery, anterior communicating artery, right? So let us have a look um, from medial side. Yes, this is the internal carotid artery and this is the anterior cerebral artery. Look at it here. So, it passes in the longitudinal fissure medially, most importantly, medially. And it goes all the way medially until it reaches by its branch the parieto occipital sulcus, the sulcus between the parietal and the occipital lobes. Now, so what are the branches of anterior cerebral artery. So most of arteries, most of the uh, uh, main arteries, I mean anterior or middle or posterior cerebral arteries, they are, they have central branch and cortical branch. Plus, for example, the anterior cerebral artery, ACA, uh, has also a callosal branch. I will tell you why. Let us start with the central branch. Once it passes here, it uh, passes through the anterior perforated uh, uh, substance and it supplies look the hypothalamus here and also the septum bellucidum and the uh, uh, rostrum of the corpus callosum the first part or the head of corpus callosum we call it rostrum of corpus uh, callosum and not just the, um, I would say, not just the rostrum of corpus callosum, but I mean the, the, the beginning, because it supplies all the corpus callosum except the splenium. The splenium or the tail, splenium it means tail. So it's supplied by posterior cerebral, not anterior cerebral. So let us stop here. So it supplies again the hypothalamus, septum bellucidum, and um, uh, also it supplies, if you remove the septum bellucidum, you will get the head of cardiac nucleus. And lateral to the cardiac nucleus, I mean laterally, there is internal capsule. Lateral to internal capsule, you have a lintiform nucleus. So these structures, including the uh, head of cardiac nucleus, lintiform nucleus, and in between the internal capsule, all of these structures supplied by the central branch of anterior cerebral artery. This is the anterior cerebral artery. So furthermore, as you see, it supplies all the medial area, medial surface of the uh, hemisphere continues above the corpus callosum. Look at pathway, very nice, above the corpus callosum until uh, it reaches um, by its branch the parieto occipital sulcus. So all of this area supplied by anterior cerebral. So keep in mind uh, when you say. Um, anterior cerebral artery, SEA, that means you have to remember that it is um, uh, controlling or dominating the medial surface of the hemisphere, right? 
and as I mentioned for the corpus callosum, yes, all the corpus callosum except the splenium part, which is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. So, um, the, uh, again, look at the shadow area. Um, here is again the cortical branch. I mean, it's another way to make it like simple. Say, okay, what's the branch? What's the area supplied by the, the from the cortex? I mean, supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. Yes, the shadow area. You see this shadow area is um, this area supplied by anterior cerebral artery. Do you think it just this area? Do you think it extends laterally, like that? So, indeed, yes. Look at the lateral surface of the hemisphere, brain hemisphere. So, the anterior cerebral artery supplies also the first upper inch of superior lateral surface. Of course, it will not extend beyond the brito occipital sulcus. So, but really, it um, extends laterally for about one inch. So this area, which is mainly controls the leg, controls the this area controls the leg mainly, especially in the motor and uh, uh, sensory uh, area, most importantly. Uh, so uh, we can say that the um, anterior cerebral artery supply the middle surface um, of the cerebral hemisphere as far as the parieto occipital sulcus and the laterally extends to the upper one inch of superior lateral surface and also here on the orbital surface look at the uh, uh, olfactory tract and pulp here olfactory tract and pulp so the anterior cerebral artery uh, supplies the medial part of the orbital surface medial part not lateral for example this is the um, optic tract so medial to it medial to it not lateral no medial to it the medial part of orbital surface so that was about the anterior cerebral artery what about the very important artery which is the middle one middle cerebral artery mca mca also is a branch of internal carotid artery look at it here you look into the anterior this is anterior view right and the temporal lobe just pulled down and we open the lateral fissure to see the middle cerebral artery this is the internal carotid artery and this is the anterior cerebral we finished it already another branch is i will use this one is the middle cerebral artery look at it here passes guys laterally also if this is the optic chiasm so it passes um lateral to the optic chiasm right this is number one and passes laterally in the depth of lateral sulcus. You see lateral passes in the lateral sulcus, right? So it passes here, as you see. And it terminates, let us shift to this figure. So again, there's a middle cerebral artery uh, in the deep in the lateral fissure. And you remember the insula. So at the insula, it divides or terminates by dividing into many terminal branches right you see so what's the branch of mca middle cerebral artery oh, excellent this is i like it i like that this is also a very important slide so um again this is the middle cerebral artery coming out from internal cerebral artery so the middle cerebral artery once passes laterally lateral to the optic chiasm as you see here so first of all it's central branch now start with the central branch then we will shift to the cortical branch so it's central branch we can call them striate arteries straight arteries because not just because they are straight in shape or straight in shape but because you know something something related to the basal ganglia called Corpus striatum, corpus striatum, here is guys. So corpus striatum, guys, it includes the cardiac nucleus and lintiform nucleus. And of course, look at it between there is internal capsule. 
this is the internal capsule. Anyway, so the caudate nucleus and lintiform nucleus, they, we call them carvus striatum. And so these arteries, striate arteries, are very important, right? They are very important because they supply the basal ganglia here, the carvus striatum, including the caudate and lintiform nucleus, and internal capsule, right? So any occlusion here guys on these arches for a reason or another this will lead to for example occlusion or hemorrhage of course can lead to contralateral hemiplegia that means paralysis on the contralateral side for example this is the right side if they are affected these arches like affected so you will get paralysis on the left side of the body this is very important we call them striate artery you remember striatum and straight artery. Then let us continue with the middle cerebral artery passes in the lateral fissure. This is the lateral uh, fissure, and then at the front uh, on the insula, it divides into many branches to supply this area. This area supply the cortical branch. Now the cortical branch of middle cerebral artery supplies this area, right? So. Which kind of area? Yes. So the cortical branch of middle cerebral artery, they supply all superior lateral surface. Remember, middle cerebral artery, some people like confuse, say middle, that means medially. No, middle cerebral supplies laterally, superior lateral surface of the hemisphere, except the upper one inch here, if you remember, that's supplied by what? anterior cerebral artery and the lower one inch supplied by the posterior cerebral right and of course the occipital lobe supplied by posterior as well so this is the area of middle cerebral artery what else other than the superior lateral surface except this kind of circle yes it supplies the lateral part of orbital surface because we say we said sorry that the medial part of orbital surface supplied by anterior cerebral but the medial uh, the um, lateral part supplied by middle cerebral artery of course it supplies the temporal pool here as you see and the insula here so again very important to know the supply of middle cerebral artery let us shift to the third important artery which is not the anterior not the, the middle it's the posterior artery posterior cerebral artery pca again it's uh it's not a branch of internal no it's a branch if you remember the terminal branch of basilar artery go back in the slides and uh, try to memorize it so the posterior cerebral artery my friend is a branch of basilar artery that runs back you know, this is the midbrain right so it passes lateral to the cerebral peduncle of or cerebral peduncle of the midbrain and goes uh, back until it reaches the occipital lobe as you see here and it where it divides, yeah, it gives many brands, but mainly um, it gives like at the, you remember the splenium of corpus callosum? Yes, at the splenium of corpus callosum or the tail of corpus callosum, uh, it gives a branch to supply this area up and another branch that continues to the occipital uh, lobe and it divides one passes through the sulcus, parietal occipital sulcus, and one passes through the calcarine sulcus. So this is calcarine branch, parietal occipital branch. Very easy to remember. This guy's written here. So these are the two terminal branches of it. Again, this is another view. Remind you the basilar artery and its two terminal branch, posterior cerebral arteries, posterior cerebral arteries so um well in this slide it 
looks like it's uh, really crowded but uh, there are a couple of two or three things are important I don't want to um, confuse yourself but again this is the basilar artery and these uh, and this is the terminal branch of it which is the posterior cerebral artery and look at it here the central branch here it gives like a branch like medially and another branch laterally the uh, uh, medial group you see here uh, person the posterior perforated substance uh, there and you have lateral um, a group that passes lateral to the cerebral peduncle. Where is the cerebral peduncle? This is the mid brain, right? And this is the cerebral peduncle you see here. So it passes lateral to the cerebral peduncle, as you see. Most importantly, either the medial group or lateral group, they supply. This is very important, very important, right? So they are supplying the thalamus, as you see here, and hypothalamus, plus the uh, cerebral peduncle you see here and the geniculate geniculate bodies of the thalamus so for example somebody in the exam asking you about the major blood supply to thalamus hypothalamus cerebral peduncle geniculate bodies you would say that posterior cerebral artery posterior cerebral artery from its two branches plus now let us now yes this is the posterior cerebral now we finish the thalamus and hypothalamus cerebral peduncle and um, geniculate uh, bodies <coughs> what else it has also um choroidal branch not just central branch look at it here so it gives one that goes like medially and one goes laterally to the choroidal plexus. This is the choroidal plexus. So the medial one goes to the uh, choroidal plexus of the third ventricle. You know this is the thalamus, and this is the thalamus on the right and one on the left. Between the two thalami, there is a space and connected by interthalamic connection. This space is the third ventricle so the medial choroidal branch passes here to supply the choroidal plexus in the third ventricle while this one is in the lateral you see this is the lateral ventricle this is the space of lateral ventricle so the the, the lateral one to the fourth ventricle so you need to focus on this third ventricle and the supply choroidal plexus of lateral ventricle right do you think this is the end no the posterior cerebral artery you see the shadow area this is the area let me use the right this is the area in the red supplied by occiput by the posterior cerebral artery so um, it supplies the tentorial surface look at it here this is the tentorial surface right and also all it supplies all the occipital lobe all surfaces of the occipital lobe excellent look at it here the temporal pool not supplied by occipital if you remember it's supplied by middle cerebral artery right keep it in your mind Anyway, this is uh, indeed a, this is a summary with the different colors um, to summarize what we uh, mentioned, which is very nice. You have you can have a look, guys. Yes, now circle of Willis. I mentioned the uh, circle of Willis. You know, some people. Uh, before that, some people pronounce it Willis, uh, uh, Wells, Circle of Wells, but um, uh, I think um, um, native people, I think they pronounce it Willis. So, um, what's the idea of Circle of Willis? Indeed, you remember that the, 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 the brain supplied by two major arteries, the internal carotid artery you see here, and the two vertebral arteries. Yes, 
at the end uh, and from the end sorry the circle of fullness is a kind of a connection as a circle that connects both two major arches to each other that means this circle in dotted line black dotted line it's a kind of a circle that connects the a branch of vertebral arteries and the branch of internal carotid arteries it's located in the base of the brain and the at the interpeduncular fossa at the base of the brain as i mentioned and it's around the optic chiasm and in the front of cerebral peduncle here um this is indeed very important circle of willis is very important so although there are variations um uh, in the circle of willis between people but mainly this is um in most of people is like that so sometimes you get like posterior communicating are constricted sometimes anterior sometime um uh the uh the um uh, uh, uh arches on the right sometime on the left and so forth but w most importantly what's the um what's the arteries make the uh, circle of willis yes let us follow the the circle you remember the basilar artery here some authorities uh say that basilar artery included you can include it you cannot it's up to you now the terminal two branch of basilar artery were the posterior cerebral arteries okay this is the two cerebral arteries that means you have two posterior cerebral arteries okay now to connect the posterior cerebral arteries to the internal carotid artery that means you have internal carotid arteries two internal carotid arteries okay to connect them you need a connection this connection was made by two arteries called posterior communicating arteries they are a branch of internal carotid arteries so posterior two posterior communicating arteries and let us move forward this is the anterior cerebral artery anterior cerebral artery right so you have two anterior cerebral arteries and they are connected to each other by communicating artery again which is anterior communicating artery so this is the circle of willis with the component with its um components what's the uh, indeed the significance of it? there is for example if there is obstruction here so the blood can reach that and right for example lift anterior cerebral artery here by another direction from here and passes from there on the other hand if there is obstruction for example here so the blood can uh, reach or bypass this by another way right so the circle of fullness is a great thing to the brain right to make sure that the blood the sources of blood supply are many and there's a sufficient blood supply even if there is obstruction somewhere right because it's a vital organ now there are a couple of branch for the for this circle indeed you have anterior and uh for example you see here anterior perforating a branch and there are posterior po perforating a branch um in which the anterior ones we are close to the optic chiasm here and to the basal ganglia internal capsule and hypothalamus while the posterior ones um close mainly to the uh, midbrain and part of subthalamus so this slide uh, is very important slide i will not discuss it because already we explained everything so it's very important to read it it will summarize every almost of everything for you and make sure you cannot you can differentiate and you are not confused right and these um figures also with different colors including for example the anterior cerebral um anterior cerebral artery this is the area of middle cerebral artery and this is the area supplied by posterior cerebral artery great to read and to have a look now this is very important this slide why also because it summarizes many things mentioned previously 
Do you remember the internal capsule? And you remember the striate arteries? They were a branch of middle silver artery. Let me show you. Here, this is the middle silver artery with the straight with the straight arteries, right? They supply the um, internal capsule here and corpus striatum. Corpus striatum, including caudate nucleus and interform nucleus. So the internal capsule mainly supplied by middle cerebral artery and also from anterior cerebral artery, if you remember the central branch. Go back to the anterior cerebral artery. Now, um, corpus striatum mainly supplied by middle cerebral artery, as I mentioned, by striate arteries. These arteries, right? Very important. Thalamus, if you remember, that's mainly supplied by posterior cerebral artery. Plus also the midbrain by posterior cerebral artery. Go back to the slide here. You maybe remember. This is the posterior cerebral artery um, that, of course, supplies the thalamus. You, you remember the uh, red color? And, of course, the, yes, midbrain by posterior cerebral artery. And um, there is a medial posterior choroidal uh, branch. Now, pawns. Nobody can... Uh, forget that the pons supplied by basilar artery because it there is a groove there called basilar groove, right? And you remember that the basilar artery uh, it gives pontine arteries, right? They supply the pons here. Now, middle oblongata, which is close to the uh, continuation, uh, inferior to the spinal cord, so mainly, you remember that the vertebral artery passes in the front of it. Uh, you remember? These are the two vertebral arteries, passes in the front of middle oblongata. And there is anterior spinal artery, posterior spinal mm, arteries, so... Um, the middle oblongata mainly by vertebral arteries, posterior and anterior spinal artery, plus um, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, it gives like medullar branch, were not shown in the figure indeed, like this. Not shown in the figure. Now, cerebellum, you remember the cerebellum has three branches, one from the vertebral artery, which is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, while the anterior inferior cerebellar and superior cerebellar, they are branch of basilar artery. Labyrinthine artery, which is a branch called labyrinthine uh, artery, which is from basilar artery again. Yes. Now, the disorder can be, for example, look at it here, for the blood vessels in the brain can be like a stroke, and the stroke can be ischemic. Look at the infarction area here, in the shadow here, because there's a blockage here, so there's no blood supply, so there's a kind of infarction here, in the middle, and this is a, a middle cerebral artery, of course. And it can be like hemorrhage for example of the obstruction like exceed the limit then the um the blood can be the vessel can be ruptured and the blood as you see here can because they are in the subarachnoid space so look at the blood here it's in all of the subarachnoid um space this is a hemorrhage so the stroke can be hemorrhage or can be ischemic um Aneurysm, sometime look at here. Aneurysm can can occur everywhere, and it's highly susceptible for um, uh, bleeding. Yes. Now, why we are talking too much about anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries and other arteries? Why? We don't know. We don't want just to mention the anatomy of those arteries. As a clinician, you have to know when some from the sign and symptoms where is the occlusion occurred. And you have to know what's the sequences of occlusion of that artery. This is very important 
uh, thing to know about each artery. So what's going on if there's occlusion of anterior cerebral artery? Let me remind you, this is the anterior cerebral artery, a branch of internal carotid passes medially on the anterior longitudinal fissure, and it ascends above the corpus callosum all the way until the parietal occipital sulcus. Now it gives a branch to this area on the medial surface and extend one inch laterally. You see the arteries? One inch laterally. And this is, if this is a motor area and this is somatosensory area, they are affected. So if you look to the homunculus um, uh, 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 cortical homunculus here, the red color is the motor, the, um, the uh, blue color represents the sensory Anyway, so any of them, they are very uh, similar to each other. But look, that the area of the foot and leg mainly at that region here, at the medial and the upper one inch of the cerebral cortex. That means this medial area and the upper lateral one inch will be affected of the motor and sensory area if there is occlusion in the anterior cerebral artery. So you expect it to get motor and sensory disturbances in the contralateral distal leg. Contralateral because the right side of the brain controls the left side. The right side controls the left. The left controls the right of your body. So, so you expected a motor and sensory disturbance in the contralateral distal leg. Why distal leg? Because we mentioned that the top area, the median and top area of the brain innervates or they innervate the lower part of your body. That means the leg here, right? Because you know that the brain is contralateral. Contralateral, you have to know that. Disproportional and it's inverted that means contralateral that means the right side of the brain controls the left side of your body this is proportional that means the hands and face they are smaller area in your body but they are highly represented in the cortex they take large area from the cortex you imagine but for example, your abdomen and thigh, abdomen, sorry, abdomen and thorax, they are the largest parts in your body, but they are represented by small area, right? Now, this, uh, now, inverted, what does it mean inverted? You see this man, homunculus representation, so it's like inverted. So, the highest area in the brain this is the top highest area in your brain, represents the lower part of your body. What's the lower part of your body? Is your legs. While the top part of your body is the head, but the head represented in the lower part of the cortex. That's why it's inverted, right? Now, what else you expect from the occlusion of anterior cerebral artery? If it's included, look at the medial surface and the anterior um, uh, uh, pool. So this area of the brain represents for calculation, decision making, uh, make a judgment, um, cognitive uh, thinking. So all of these functions will be affected, right? From the occlusion. Also, the premotor area here, which is the area this is the motor this is the premotor so the area of premotor area also will be affected which is important to store to store the um programs that will be implemented once once it needed for example you know how to dance so the program to how to dance will be stored here in the premotor area or play with the um with your pencil right so or any like fine skill movement. So stored the program, stored in the pre-motor area. Once, once it needed, the software, or you can call it software, the, the program will be transmitted to the motor area to be implemented. Now the motor area will, will implement what 
the skills that been stored in the premotor area that means motor initiation and self monitoring will be affected right because also the, the initiation of the uh, the premotor area also responsible for motor initiation to start the or to implement to initiate the movement again we discussed that okay now again this is very important what's the uh, what do you expect what kind of manifestations you get when the middle silver artery uh, uh, occluded so occlusion of middle silver artery here look at the lateral surface because it dominates on the lateral surface except the upper one inch lower one inch and the occipital lobe um, so you remember this is lateral right so you will get weakness not in the legs do you remember how many kilos this area by anterior cerebral artery now i will talk to you about middle look this area because the middle cerebral artery comes from here and passes through the lateral fissure right here right up to here right so what will be affected guys is the face arms and hands i mean more than the leg right because the legs usually under the uh, blood supply of anterior cerebral artery not middle so here is the will be affected for example in the, in the um, this is a left lateral side of the brain so you will get contralateral weakness contralateral always remember contralateral contralateral weakness in your in your face arm hand of course more than leg because it's always up to here and not just motor you mean weakness that means you talk about motor but also the sensation because you have a motor area and you have a motor area and sensory area right so also you will get also control lateral sensory loss of those uh, parts of your body because also um, uh, it supplies part of the uh, optic uh, region so um, optic nerve I mean um, then um, you will get visual field cut because there is a damage will be to the optic radiations right uh, most importantly and this is really uh, it's it's not most important because contralateral weakness contralateral sensor loss they are very important signs and symptoms but also you have very important um, uh, brilliant uh, sign or symptom which is uh, the uh, uh, aphasia the aphasia guys the language disturbances the patient because this is the procus area motor speech area and this is the vernix area or receptive speech area so the patient will lose both or one of them right it depends on where is the occlusion right so you will get a problem with the procus area and or uh, uh, vernix area now the occlusion of posterior cerebral artery which is also very important now you know that the posterior cerebral area mainly focus on the posterior part and the the uh, 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 posterior uh, i mean part of the brain which is the occipital lobe where is the visual area is there right so occlusion there you will the the patient will get visual disturbances including um, contralateral again contralateral because the brain it's uh, the representation will be contralateral contralateral uh, homonomous hemianopia what does it mean more details about homonomous hemianopia i will leave it to the lecture of the eye after a couple of weeks we will uh, talk about the eye and we will discuss all of these things but for now it's good to know that the visual area will be affected and for example if the lift look at number three that means the blood supply to the lift occipital lobe affected or posterior cerebral artery here the lift uh, lift posterior cerebral artery then 
what you what you will get that you will the patient will lose the um, visual field of the contralateral side of both eyes. Hamanamas hemianopia. That means the visual field of the right side of both eyes because the affected is the left cerebral hemisphere, right? This is the will be the affected visual field. We'll talk more about it. So can be also which is very rare when there is a bilateral lesion that means on the visual area on the right and also in the left which is very rare but there is something called Anton Pampniski syndrome Anton Pampniski's syndrome so the patient can see the patient can see by his eyes right can get a photo but there is no interpretation in the brain right there is a cortical blindness Yes, the eyes are function very well. Optic nerve function, uh, function functioning very well. You can see the photo and something like that can be transmitted to the brain, but the area damaged. That means there is no interpretation. There is no processing. Plus, because the occipital lobe, the occipital uh, posterior, sorry, cerebral artery, supplies the temporal part of the lower inch of temporal um, lobe, which is. Um, for memory that means you can expect a memory impairment right um, let us shift to the venous drainage what we mentioned earlier or what we discussed earlier um, uh, were about the blood vessels supplying the brain right now what about the cerebral venous drainage well first of all let us simply divide it into superficial veins and deep veins like any part of your body so look at this uh, coronal section of the brain look at these veins now they are located in the subarachnoid space this is a subarachnoid space so these are superficial veins these superficial veins as i mentioned located in the subarachnoid space and drain the mainly the cortical surface right the area close to the cortex here right so like look at these veins now what about the deep veins deep veins located here deep in the brain and they of course drain the deep structures in general these veins are thin wall and devoid of valves they don't have valves right that's why what's the purpose of uh, the absence of the valves in order to smoothen the drainage facilitate the drainage of the blood in the brain because you know any obstruction or struggle in the drainage of the blood from the brain it leads to brain edema so these uh, at the end either the superficial or the uh, deep veins ultimately they will drain the blood as you see here into the dural venous um, uh, venous sinuses which is i think already explained in the lecture of the meninges in which the dura matter has two layers and this layer and meningeal layer they are separated from each other to create a kind of caps these caps lined with endothelial cells uh, something called dural venous uh, sinus so venous let us start with the drainage of the cerebral hemisphere you know here is the palm removed and of course the dura matter as well so look at the uh, cerebral cortex from this side well first of all you would notice uh, my friends that uh, there are they are cerebral veins just to facilitate memorize those veins they are cerebral veins drain the blood from the cerebrum so there some of them superior some of them are inferior and i would remind you that this is the area of the lateral fissure this is the area of the lateral fissure so these veins above the lateral fissure they are indeed superior cerebral veins while these veins inferior to the cerebral fissure they are 
inferior cerebral veins. So you have superior and inferior cerebral veins. Okay. Now, the superior cerebral veins here, guys, they are above the lateral fissure and drain, if you see, in this dural sinus, superior sagittal sinus. And they also drain in this superficial vein. This vein, uh, it's located on the surface of lateral fissure, right? It's called superficial middle cerebral vein. Listen, it is middle cerebral vein, but it's superficial because there is deep one, right? So, the uh, again, the superior cerebral veins drain into superior sagittal sinus and also drain into middle, uh, superficial middle cerebral vein. Here, right? Now, the inferior cerebral veins they are located below the, la, la, below the lateral fissure or below the superficial middle cerebral vein and drain again into middle cerebral, superficial middle uh, cerebral vein. So they drain into superficial middle cerebral vein and also into the transverse sinus here. Transverse sinus. Now, I think we mentioned this vein superficial middle cerebral vein many times let us have a look and dig deep a little bit about this vein it's superficial it's located in the or it runs in the superficial part of the lateral fissure right this is the lateral fissure and this is the superficial middle cerebral vein and it uh, i would say it's posterior and look it's posterior divided like mercedes sign right the Alamtil Mercedes, Mashi. It's like this. So, one end, like um, uh, connected with the superior sagittal sinus, and one connected with the transverse sinus. Right? Two sinuses, one above and one below. And anteriorly, it curved to connect or drain into cavernous sinus here is the connection all of three limbs are connected to sinuses either cavernous superior sagittal and transverse so this is a cavernous sinus if you wonder where is the cavernous sinus so that was about um, overview about the um, superficial cerebral veins but what about the deep ones Yes, this is a, a, a sagittal plane. Shows here, my friends, the blood drained from the deep structures, including the basal ganglia, internal capsule, thalamus, and so forth. So, from these structures, the blood drain into internal cerebral vein. Yes, it's cerebral vein, but it's internal one, right? This is the internal cerebral vein, and there is another one here. So they are united, they are united to form the um, uh, um, great cerebral vein. This is the great cerebral vein. So the great cerebral vein shortly continuous with the sinus known as straight sinus it's like straight above the cerebellum you see straight sinus but leave it for now there are a couple of things we have to talk about again this is the internal cerebral united to form a great cerebral vein or we call it great vein of gallon the scientists who discovered it then it continues with the um the great vein continues with the straight sinus but before that let me give you a little bit about the internal cerebral vein and how they formed to form a great cerebral vein. Again, look at the sagittal. This is the thalamus here. This is the thalamus here. In between, look at the, there is, of course, their basal ganglia and structures. So the internal cerebral vein here, internal cerebral vein here, united to form a great cerebral 
vein. The great cerebral vein continues, of course, or drain to straight, uh, straight sinus. But before that, there is a couple of things joined here. Um, the, I would talk first about the internal cerebral vein. These veins, let us take a cross section and have a look here. Look at the thalamus, thalamus here, thalamus here. This is caudate nucleus, caudate nucleus. And look at it here. There is a vein here between the caudate nucleus and the thalamus, right? It's known as thalamostraight vein. You remember that the caudate nucleus and lentiform nucleus are part called corpus striatum. Corpus striatum. So that means this vein between the corpus striatum and the thalamus called thalamostriaid vein. This thalamostriaid vein joins another vein here, which is it is a called plexus that produces the CSF. So this is a choroid vein united nearby the interventricular foramen here. So again, thalamostriate vein with the choroid vein to form internal cerebral veins. Internal cerebral veins. They united back to the thalamus here to form the great cerebral vein. Right? Now, the great cerebral vein. The great cerebral vein, that means formed by the union of two internal cerebral, right? And also, if you back here, the great cerebral vein receives, let me erase this, the great cerebral vein receives also another vein called basal vein right and it runs back i mean the great cerebral vein once it receives formed by internal cerebral veins and receives the basal vein back and it joins the inferior sagittal sinus inferior above the um, uh, here above the corpus callosum this is the corpus callosum right so above the corpus callosum here at the lower border of falx cerebri if you remember the falx cerebri anyway so um, the it joins the inferior sagittal sinus to form or drain uh, or form the straight sinus. This is the straight sinus, right? This is the story of the straight sinus. Look, here is the opening of inferior sagittal sinus, right? This one. I don't want to talk too much about it. That's enough. Already we covered that. So, about the um, uh, deep cerebral veins, we mentioned the middle cerebral vein, but that was the superficial one. But deep middle cerebral vein, again, this is the uh, superficial one. Do you remember the super uh, the superficial middle cerebral vein that was on the surface of lateral fissure? But there is another one which is deep, deep middle cerebral. The same name, middle cerebral vein, but it's really deep in the uh, sulcus. The uh, deep uh, middle cerebral vein runs, as I mentioned, depth in the lateral sulcus, and it terminates here at the anterior perforated substance. Um, in which uh, it um, participates in the formation of this uh, vein. How's, how's the basal vein? Do you remember this one? Let me show you. Do you remember this vein? Let me erase this. Do you, rem Oops. Do you remember the basal vein? This one that joins the great cerebral vein? How's formed this one? Well, indeed, um, this basal vein, we are looking to the inferior surface of the brain, right? This vein formed by the deep, the, the uh, union of deep middle cerebral vein with the anterior cerebral vein. Anterior cerebral vein, yes. 
Do you remember the anterior cerebral artery? Yes, they accompanied by veins. These veins carry the same name of the arteries. They are not anterior cerebral artery, they are anterior cerebral vein. They join the middle. Let me raise it now. So the anterior cerebral vein again at this area anterior perforated substance join the deep and uh, middle cerebral vein to form the basal vein that passes around the peduncles uh, of the middle brain now look at the anterior perforated substance there's a kind of small veins here called striate veins striate veins which is you know similar to striate arteries so drain the blood from the basal uh, ganglia so Again, here is the basal vein that, of course, it drains into a uh, great cerebral vein. So, the basal vein, this one, as I mentioned, formed by the union of anterior cerebral vein, the middle cerebral vein, and straight veins in the anterior peripheral substance and ultimately uh, terminates in the great cerebral vein so now conclusion guys look at the midbrain here so the mid the blood from the midbrain it drains mainly through this vein which is close to it lateral to it right through the basal vein and uh, a great cerebral vein now blood from the pons blood from the pons also from basal vein you see from basal vein and also part of it to the cerebral cerebellar veins right cerebellar veins now because the um, pons very close to the cerebellum you know all they are across the cerebellum but you know relatively uh, medulla oblongata it drains by spinal veins right cerebellum now cerebellum it has a couple of uh, uh, roots to drain the blood the first one which is through uh, through again the great cerebral vein this one Look at it here, and also it throw the venous sinuses related to it. For example, this is a transverse. If you say, um, um, uh, oh no, it's not. It's not shown here. The transverse. Uh, close to the sinuses. For example, this is the confluence of the sinus and the transverse sinus should be around that area, so it drains there now although this lecture although this part sorry of the lecture should be or it, i think covered in the um, lecture of meninges and neurosciences but just in harry i will try to iterate a couple of things here that the dural venous sinus you see here that the blood ultimately will drain on those sinuses that i mentioned um, uh, made by the two layers of dura matter, industrial layer and meningeal layer, separated from each other at some locations to create a sinus that lined by endothelial cells and they have no valves. So the blood drain at the end into them. So we have superior sagittal sinus and parallel to it, inferior to it, there is inferior sagittal sinus. And also, uh, you have straight sinus plus you have transverse sinus in the transverse groove on the skull and sigmoid sinus which is should be like this in the sigmoid um, a groove also um, in the skull and we have you know the sigmoid will continue Ultimately, as once it passes from the internal jugular for, from the jugular for, for ramen into internal jugular uh, vein. Plus, we have other sinuses like uh, cavernous uh, sinus. We have. Um, let me show you here uh, the 
for example look at the transverse let's start with the transverse and there are a couple of things i will show you but let us start with the transverse uh, science shown here so you get a transverse groove of course they are uh, they are two one on the right and one on the left and they uh, indeed begin at the internal occipital protuberance and if you look you have right one and left one the right sinus the right transverse sinus continues with the superior sagittal sinus but the left transverse sinus continues with the straight sinus right but anyway there is a confluence area here to submit all of them so the transverse sinuses in general they receive um, uh, blood from the uh, superior betrothal sinus and also from the inferior cerebral vein do you remember the cerebral veins below the um, below the lateral uh, fissure inferior cerebral veins yes they drain into uh, transverse sinus plus cerebellar veins as I mentioned before a couple of slides before two slides and from the cerebellum of course and triploic veins from the um, skull anyway the transverse sinus um, turning down as a sigmoid as a sigmoid sinus sinus now um, which is a continuation of the transverse sinus and once it reaches the jugular foramen it becomes continuous with the superior uh, pulp of the internal jugular vein and now it's internal jugular vein once it passes through the foramen the jugular foramen there now there is another i would say funny small sinus there which is at the attachment of the falx cerebelli to the uh, piece of the skull it's created there so it drains um, uh, uh, into confluence of uh, sinuses now again another sinuses uh, the superior and inferior betrothal sinuses look at the cavernous sinus first here on the right and on the left look the superior um betro superior and inferior betrothal signs they call because you know the betros part of temporal bone this part of the bone so there is one passes on the upper border of it and one passes on the lower border of it so this is superior betrothal and inferior betrothal sinuses the superior betrothal sinus drains the cavernous sinus into transverse sinus as we mentioned but the inferior betrothal sinus it drains into internal jugular vein here's again this is the cavernous sinus and this is the uh, uh, superior betrothal sinus that drains into transverse sinus and this is the inferior betrothal sinus that drains into um, the internal jugular uh, vein so uh, lastly again this also i think covered in the uh, but i will talk more about the cavernous sinus you know the cavernous sinus again another sinuses situated in the middle cranial fossa as you see here this is the cilla torsica of sphenoid bone so they are located on each side of cilla torsica or the body of sphenoid bone and they are communicated they are not separated from each other because they are interconnected you see by intercavernous uh, sinus sinuses so they are connected on each side by intercavernous uh, sinuses now the cavernous sinus uh, or sinuses most importantly um, they receive blood from if you remember the um, mid superficial middle cerebral vein drain into them and also most importantly which is very important the ophthalmic vein right and um, from pterygoid plexus in the infratemporal fossa pterygoid plexus also drain into cavernous sinus which is really important 
Now, this is very important because clinically is important. Related to, so this is the, we call it the danger triangle of the face or the danger area of the face, which is located between the root of your nose and the two angles of your mouth. So this is the danger area. Why is danger area in case if there is abscess, infection, uh, sinusitis, uh, or any source of uh, infection here? It's um, sometime it's transmitted to the brain transmitted to the brain how it's through of course the uh, to the cavernous sinus uh, through the facial vein look at the facial vein here this is the facial vein right so the facial vein drains blood from pterygoid plexus also drains uh, blood in from the infraorbital vein and also from around the nose so the blood from that area of the face will be that of course via facial vein and inferior ophthalmic vein the infection blood or whatever transmitted into the cavernous sinus right into the cavernous sinus so the infection from the face transmitted through facial vein and inferior ophthalmic vein into the cavernous sinus. Somebody can say, what about the superior ophthalmic vein? Yes, but mainly the superior ophthalmic vein joins the inferior ophthalmic one, then the inferior drains into cavernous sinus. That's why mostly we say facial vein and inferior ophthalmic vein because the superior one usually drains into inferior but sometimes it drains directly into cavernous sinus that's fine so uh, what i want to say that this is a really uh, important route for the spread of infection from the face to the brain that may lead to cavernous sinus thrombosis which is very important now Yes, if there is a thrombosis in the cavernous sinus, now what's the problem? The problem also here that the cavernous sinus you see has a um, couple of structures, very important structures. Some of them centrally located, some of them laterally rotate, uh, located. So centrally, there is the internal carotid artery and on the other side as well. So thrombosis here will... Uh, diminish the blood, decreases the blood to the um, uh, to the brain. This is a major one of the major sources to the brain. Plus, you have a cranial nerves. Uh, three, four, five. Not uh, just um, V one, V two, and cranial nerve number six. So, just to remember that cranial nerve number six, absent nerve, which is in the center, close to uh, internal carotid artery. While the cranial nerve number three, four, and V1, V2 of cranial nerve number five, they are located laterally, as you see. Plus, there is very important, the master of all glands, which is the uh, pituitary gland, located in the cilia torsica, here in the middle. So venous, so uh, for example, in this um, uh, MRI, you see here is a lift cavernous uh, sinus uh, thrombosis uh, as a source of infection in the face. Also, this is a case also of infection in the face. You see here with um, uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis as the infection from here transmitted from uh, the face to the cavernous sinus. And you know when there is obstruction in the venous drainage, that will lead to uh, brain edema, cerebral swelling, that increases the internal uh, cerebral pressure or intracranial pressure. Thank you, and uh, these are our references. Uh, I would like to uh, extra focus on these things. Uh, you have to know uh, where is uh, the basilar artery formed. It's important. And where is terminated. And also I would like to know mainly the branch of vertebral artery, uh, especially anterior spinal, posterior spinal, and posterior inferior cerebellar artery. 
and the basilar artery also I like it it's important you see this sign sign astellar here and the branch of basilar artery and I would like to uh, know the uh, mainly the branch of internal carotid artery including hypophyseal branch posterior communicating ophthalmic terminal branch you know you have to know the branch of these arts you have to know which uh, uh, these branches are related to what and these branches related to internal carotid artery right ophthalmic anterior cerebral middle cerebral this is very important now very very important is the anterior cerebral artery and everything related to it right and the branch of it what is supplying and the middle cerebral artery it's a branch as well straight artery is very important um, posterior cerebral artery it's supply here guys these and these stuff I already mentioned very important the area and circle of Willis very important you expect a question exam mainly about it and um, summary you have to read it of course this is very important to know these structures and occlusion occlusion very important the occlusion of each artery very important right of each one right now uh, cerebral venous drainage uh, I'm expect you to understand it and define the uh, different veins especially the major veins right uh, say uh, yes where is the superior cerebral vein, inferior cerebral vein, uh, superficial middle cerebral vein? Just look at it. Deep cerebral vein. Look at the major veins, right? And uh, deep middle cerebral vein, anterior straight, like the main ones, right? Uh, basal vein, yes. Um, dural venous sinuses, it's related mainly to the. Um, lecture of meninges and uh, ventricles but uh, it's good to know the major just to watch it and know the major ones I have to check if it's already covered or not so uh, yes cavernous sinus cavernous sinus is very important cavernous sinus as uh, cavernous sinus is very important this is very important right this is very important. Structure is passing from there. Yes. Thank you.